Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning, and for all those of you who are joining us online, welcome. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. Well, as we mentioned earlier, today is Mother's Day, so as we get started, I want to take a moment to thank all mothers for the selfless investment and the sacrifice that they have made in each and every one of us. In a moment, I'm going to pray for you. I also want to take a moment to pray for Pastor Craig this morning as he is preaching remotely. I pray that God would use him this morning and that he would find some rest as well uh, here this week. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for this day and we're grateful, Lord, for the love of a mother, for the sacrifice, for the love, and for the generosity that they give to us each and every day. God, we're thankful for the way that you have reflected your love to our mothers. And we pray that today that you would share your joy with them. Pray that today would be a day where they feel appreciated by those that love them, their children and husbands, but ultimately, God, by you. That they would know you and your presence in their life today. God, we pray for Pastor Craig as well as he preaches this morning remotely as an extension, God, of our church. Lord, that you empower him and use him to touch people's hearts, Lord, for you. And God, for the scripture that we look at now here this morning, we pray that you would open up our lives. You would open our minds to think of you in a new way. That you'd open up our hearts and that you would challenge us to live differently today. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I have a question for you as we get started. Have you ever been overwhelmed by a test? Maybe it's a, a test at work or a test in life. I have two daughters that are in school. One is graduating from high school this year. One is graduating from middle school this year. So one of the common discussions that we have in my family is the looming doom of a coming test. For them, the tests are many. They have tests in math. They have tests in English. They have tests in statistics, tests in science, and probably the most difficult test for, all, for both of them is cleaning their room. But often, when they are getting ready to prepare for a test, they will lament to me about how much they do not want to take this test. This week, one of my daughters was doing this repeatedly when I reminded her that if she would have just started preparation, when she started lamenting to me, that she would be halfway done with completion of preparing for the test that she was facing. Well, maybe you can relate. When we were faced with a challenge in the classroom, a challenge in life, or maybe even a test in our faith, sometimes the most difficult step to take is the very first one. This week, we are in the third week of our series entitled Promised. And over the last two weeks, we've been taking some time to look through the Old Testament at one that is promised. One that the Old Ta Ta Testament tells us is coming. A Messiah that will come to redeem and to save. We know him, of course, is Jesus. Today, we're going to look at an interesting section of Scripture that has already been read to us. It's a test for sure, but one that points to a coming Messiah and to a love that is greater than we could ever imagine. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 3, I want to read to you again this morning our text. The Bible says this, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. Earlier this week, I was uh, spending some time with Pastor Craig, thanking him for such a heartwarming and upbeat passage to teach on, on Mother's Day. Well, you can't say this. Look at what happens when mom's not around, right? When you look at this passage. <laughs> but for Abraham, in this passage that we're looking at, it was a test. 
first test that we see is that this is a test of faith. You see, years before, God promised him a son. Many sons, actually. There's actually a song about this. I don't know if you know it. But God promised him a legacy. God promised him one that would come actually through his son Isaac that would eventually redeem the world. But there is a problem. God is now asking him to do something that is unthinkable. God is asking him to do something that is unspeakable. And God is now asking him to do something that is seemingly in direct conflict with the promise that he has already given him. What we see in this text, though, is that Abraham takes steps of faith. When God asks him to do something, when he faces this test of faith, he takes steps. The first step that he takes is one of listening. You know, it takes faith to listen to God. When God called Abraham, he said three simple words. Here I am. Here I am is a statement of submission. We might say today, what do you want from me, Lord? Or how can I serve you, God? But rather than telling God a list of things that he wanted, Abraham postured himself in a way where he said to God, God, whatever you want, I am willing to do. Here I am. He recognizes that God is in charge and that he is his servant. Friends, it takes faith to listen to God, to posture our hearts and our lives in a way where we say, here I am. God, what do you want to do with me? How can I use this day to serve you? It takes faith to listen. The second step of faith that we see in this text is that he moved. When God asked Abraham to move, he actually moved. God gives him an impossible task. And I don't know if you noticed this, but he actually gives him an impossible task with less than perfect directions. Take your son and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice your son on a mountain that I will show you. Now, if I was Abraham, I would have asked for some more detail on this assignment. This was a, a three-day journey, if you will, into the wilderness, into an area that was pretty vague. But God says, go, and the next morning, Abraham gets up and he moves. I don't know if you're like me, but whenever I'm going somewhere, I like to have a little more detail in my directions. I was actually spending some time with our staff and one member from our parish council this week. We were at a conference uh, in Ohio. And we had a free evening, and we decided that we wanted to go out and get some dinner, get some barbecue together. And so we talked our driver, the one who was driving, into taking us to a restaurant on this day and this evening. And so he was driving, and I was the navigator. For some reason, I was the navigator, and I was sitting in the back seat of the car. And so I had my GPS, and the driver was in front of me. And apparently, he likes a little more direction, too, before he moves. And so I told him at one point, I'm like, hey, just turn right here. And I'm like, just keep going on this road. And you know what he said to me? He actually goes, Mike, I don't do it this way. Which I think means he wants a little more detail in the direction. So I said, oh, you want a little more detail? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I'm like, well, go four and a half miles down this road, and then you'll take a right. And I'll, how about I let you know when we get within a mile of the turn? And he goes, that would be better. That would be much better. You know, many of us, when it comes to driving and moving just physically in our life, we want to know the details of this. But faith will often require you to move before you know the destination. Sometimes God just says, get up and start going. The third step of faith that Abraham makes is one of trust. It's a step of trust. See, Abraham knew God's promise, and he knew God's character as well. He had already tried to make it happen on his own. You can read about this in the chapters preceding this. And it created a mess, a whole bunch of family drama. But now he does not know how this will end, but he trusts. He trusts in what he knows of God, and he trusts in his character, and he moves forward. 
For Abraham, this was a test of faith. It is also for him a test of provision. Who will provide? In verse 4, the scripture says this. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. He carried himself the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now this passage that we're looking at becomes even more uncomfortable as Abraham continues to obey God. This is a great reminder for us that there will be times in life when God calls us to obey and the conflict or the circumstances that we are facing may not be immediately resolved. Sometimes it gets more uncomfortable before God shows us what he wants us to learn. But as Abraham is moving forward, believing that God will provide, he hints in verse 4 when he tells to his servants, when he says that we will go worship and we will come back, that we will return. Did he know that God would stop him? Did he believe that God would resurrect Isaac if he followed through? The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11 seems to believe that. We don't know exactly what Abraham was thinking, but he did trust that God would provide. And in this amazing moment, when his son, who was old enough to realize that they do not have everything they need for the sacrifice, says, Dad, where is the lamb? He responds beautifully by saying, the Lord will provide. For Abraham, this was a test of provision. And it was a test of his faith. But it was also a test of priority. A test of priority. Verse 9. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. A final test for Abraham, friends, was one of priority. Do you love me or do you love the things that I give you? What is the priority? What is first in your heart? It has been said before that when a good thing becomes the main thing, it can become a bad thing very quickly. Let me say that again. When a good thing becomes the main thing, it can become a bad thing very quickly. You see, there is only one thing that God wants to be first in our hearts, friends, and that's him. And there are times when good things can sneak into that place in our hearts. Our jobs, our kids, even our stuff at times can become the priority. And even though these are important and valued, God does not want them to be number one. That space is reserved for him. It's for him. 
You know, I, I've realized this in my own heart from time to time, as, as maybe you have as you examine yours. And one time this happened a few years ago. I had transitioned into a new church and into a, a new challenge of ministry, and I was serving in a startup campus of a large church. And if you've ever you know, gone from a, a large company to maybe a startup, you know that there are shifts that you experience uh, when you take those, you know, those kind of steps. And I was experiencing that. Up until that point, I had served in three large congregations. And when you serve in a, in a large congregation, you kind of just get accustomed to a lot of just the, the things that come with bigger churches. There's ministry toys that you have. There's people that you have. And there's just things that you get accustomed to. And if you're not careful, they can become too important in your heart. Well, this particular day, I was starting a new work with a new group of people in this startup campus. And I remember the first day that I started, 18 people showed up on that day. And it was quite different than what I experienced before. And I remember lamenting when I was speaking to the Lord because I missed some of the stuff, some of the toys. I missed people because there wasn't many people at that time as well. And I felt like God just said to me, do you love me enough? Do you love me enough to serve the people and love the people that come, that I bring to you? Do you love me enough? Am I your priority? You know, by the way, there's this funny thing. When we make God the priority of our life, when we make him the priority of y'all all, the rest of our life seems to run better. I don't know if you've noticed this. If you want to be a better parent, for example, make God the priority. You'll learn things about Jesus and it will affect the way that you lead your children. If you want to be a better manager or teacher at work, make God the priority. Look at how Jesus led his disciples, apply those principles to the way that you work. You'll be a better manager or leader at work for sure. If you want to be a better pastor, make God the priority, and you'll surf out of the overflow of your heart. For Abraham, this was a test, a test of his faith, a test of provision, and a test of priority. But what does it mean for us today? When we look at this text, especially on Mother's Day, what does it mean for you and what does it mean for me? The first challenge, I think, for us today is to keep this in mind. Growing closer to God will challenge our comfort. It will challenge our comfort. So I was discussing this text with Pastor Craig earlier this week and how it relates to mother. mothers. He said, hey, good luck. It's not the most heartwarming text to teach on. But friends, who in a very real way knows more about giving up personal comfort than mothers. No family grows without a mother that decides to set aside their own personal comfort for their children. In my observation, I've noticed that the moment a woman knows that she's going to be a mother, personal comfort seems to become a second priority in their life. And what is true in growing a family is also true in life. One does not become a great athlete from the couch. Athletes sacrifice time, energy, and comfort in order, to hone, in order to hone their skills and become the best that they can be on the field or on the court. No entrepreneur has ever grown a company if comfort is their top priority. Making something new in the marketplace requires hours of sacrifice and hours of work. And I have seen had friends that have gone through the journey of medical school and I watched them serve their residency. Comfort is sacrificed for sure if one wants to serve our community in the medical field as well. What's true in life, though, is also true in our faith. God, it is true that God is a comforter. But I have noticed that he's far less concerned with my personal plans of comfort than I am. And when I follow him, he routine, routinely asks me to step outside of what I know in order to grow. You know, one of the teams at our church right now 
is working on an area of ministry that I'm very excited about. We are actually in the middle right now of a, a strategic plan. And we have members from our church and staff members from our church that have been working over the past few months to gain perspective on where we are as a church. They're actually researching opportunities for us. And one of our our teams right now is working on a project that we're calling our Discipleship Pathway. They're creating new places that you will see in the coming months over the next year where we can grow deeper in our understanding of, of God and deeper in our trust of God as well. Pastor Robbie is heading up this team as well as Pastor Doug and some other lay leaders in our church as well. But Pastor Doug shared a really interesting thought that I, that I want to make sure that I give him credit for that might become the framework for this pathway here at Christ Church. And it's really all around four questions that we must ask, we must answer in our journey with God. The first question is one that you might anticipate. It's a question that maybe you have answered yes to in your life. And this question is this. Will I begin a relationship with Jesus and follow him? All of us are faced with that question from time to time. And we must answer that question. Will we begin a relationship and will we continue to follow him and make him Lord of our life? And this team is working on a series of classes and trainings and groups where if that is your starting point, you can grow in your understanding of God and your, in your courage to follow him as well. But their second question is a little bit more challenging along this pathway. This question is this. Will I step out of my comfort zone and begin to rely on God's power rather than my own? Now, I am looking forward personally to teaching classes, to sitting in classes where this is the starting point where a group of people have already made that decision that have answered, yes, I will step out of my comfort zone. I will put myself in a position that needs a greater power than I possess by myself. And I will step in to what God challenges me to do. You see, friends, we are living in an interesting time, a time where personal comfort may be at an all-time premium. In fact, it has been a valid excuse to simply say the words, I'm not comfortable with that, to get out of work or meetings or anything that we don't want to do over the past two years. But if we want to grow, we have to be willing, at least at times, to step into places that will challenge our comfort. This is how God grows our faith. The second way that I think this applies to our life is simply a reminder. It's a reminder that we need a substitute. Like Isaac, who needed a substitute, we too need a substitute. You know, when one reads this passage, this passage, one of the reasons why I think it is so disturbing is that we often put ourselves in the position of Abraham. And when we do this, it naturally makes us ask this question, what would I do if God asked me to do something like this? But as we consider this, I would invite you to look at this passage in a little different way. Rather than Abraham, would you consider the place of Isaac? It doesn't take long, friends, in life to know that we need help. That the decisions that we make that the conditions of this world, well, they remind us that we are not enough. Whether it is through the binding control of addiction, the frailty of life and sickness, or just the pressure of life that exceeds our capacity, we all know that we need more. Like Isaac, who asks, where is the lamb? All of us have asked, where is God? Or stated, I need God at some time in our lives. Deep down, each of us in our hearts, we know we need more. And we know that we are not enough. Years later, John the Baptist would show us the lamb. As Isaac says, where is the lamb? John sees Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as you know, hindsight 
always shows us things more clearly. You see, the journey that God sent Abraham on was not to some random mountain in the wilderness, but rather to a place that would become very, very special. Years later, there would be a city that is built around that very mountain, a city that would become the center of the movement of God, Jerusalem. Solomon would actually build his temple on that very mountain, on that place where Abraham passed his test. And many scholars believe that Jesus actually walked down this mountain as he descended into Jerusalem on his triumphal entry that we celebrate on Palm Sunday. And on the day that Jesus gave his life on the mountain of Golgotha, it was only 300 meters away. And there's a good chance that as he hung on the cross, he was looking at this place this place where Abraham passed his test, this place where one who would be promised came that day. In Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, the scripture tells us of the one who was promised and says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Friends, like Isaac, we all too need a substitute. We know from time to time that we are stuck. And this passage points to the one that is to come. Final thought for us here this morning, I hope is one of just appreciation. And I don't know how to say it other than this. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. You say, see, friends, there are certain passages in Scripture that I think, us, think, that I think gives us a, a picture of God's heart. They help us understand God, maybe even see a little bit about what he thinks or, or how it feels to be God. For example, when you read the book of Hosea, you see God asking his prophet to do another strange thing. He asks Hosea to go find a wife who will be repeatedly unfaithful to him. He wants Hosea to care for a woman named Gomer. And every time she strays, he asks Hosea to go get her and to bring her home. Friends, he does this, of course, to show us his heart for you and me. That when we walk away, he still loves us. Maybe you have been told that God is angry at you because you turned away from him. But I think when we walk away, it is more like heartbreak. You see, God pursues us. God loves us. God is faithful to us when we are unfaithful to him. And he always welcomes us home. Like that passage, this passage too reveals something about God's heart. You see, when one makes a sacrifice... It is always for a greater love. For example, if a soldier is on the battlefield and he sacrifices his or her life, it is, all, it is only for a greater love, the love of country, for the love of those that he serves. I have known businessmen who have sacrificed opportunities at work for a greater love because they've wanted to spend more time with their family. And who sacrifices more than mothers? Mothers sacrifice time, sleep, the best years of their life for a greater love, their children. What about this sacrifice? This sacrifice is unthinkable. This sacrifice is unspeakable. So I was studying for this message this week and lamenting like my daughters who lament for their test, the sacrifice or potential sacrifice that God was calling Abraham to, I was wrestling with it. And I felt like God was speaking to me and said to me, if it's true that we must love one greater than the sacrifice that we're making, this sacrifice that is so great, oh, how much must he love 
us. You see, friends, there is one that would carry the wood up the hill. There is one that was bound and pierced for our transgressions. And there is one who willingly gave his life. And if God the Father allowed this for you and allowed this for me, it makes, has to make us, make us wonder, how much does God love us? John 3, verse, 3, 3, verse 16, Scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Abraham was blessed for his faithfulness. When we look at the book of Genesis, we see this as a turning point in his life. From here on out, he experiences an abundance of blessing in his life. Hebrews chapter 11, Scripture actually puts him in the faith hall of fame with many other greats in the Scripture. But this passage also points us to one who is promised. One who will come. And friends, to a sacrifice is greater than we can even understand. A love that is beyond our comprehension. Let us pray. Father God, we are grateful for this morning and grateful for the lessons that you've taught us in this scripture. God, thank you for the way that you have drawn us closer to you. We are grateful for the times of growth that you've placed in our lives when you ask us to step out of those moments that are comfortable, God. And today, in faith, we say to you the same words that Abraham said many years ago. Here I am. God, we ask that you would use us, that you would teach us. We are grateful for the substitute that we have in Jesus Christ. And God, for the overwhelming love that you have expressed to each and every one of us. It is in your name we pray. Amen.